This week on Game Data, I want to show you one of the coolest phones I own. This beast right here. Now, for newcomers, I'm sure you're staring at this phone and thinking, well, that's not so special, is it? It's just an example of a large slab phone. Samsung makes like 50 of those per year. So what? But hey, 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 look at this. Oh, that's right. This is actually a dual screen phone. This beautiful design right here is called the LG Wing, and it stands as the pinnacle of phone innovation from the past however many years since 90% of phones started to become kind of samey slabs. Now, before we get into what it's like to use this phone, let's get into some background for those who missed its coverage when it was brand new. The LG Wing launched back in 2020 as the final phone from LG's smartphone division, which closed in 2021. For many, like myself, LG will always be remembered as that one smartphone company that innovated hard in a market where phone designs were growing more monotonous by the year. Unfortunately, while much of their innovation was cool as heck for smartphone nerds like me, it often came at the cost, or detriment to, the overall appeal of their flagships. For example, I love the heck out of my LG G5. The idea of a modular smartphone at the time was perfect. And I actually got quite a bit of use out of swapping in the camera grip as an extended battery and overall comfortable way to hold the device. Yet LG wound up abandoning the modular concept altogether with their next smartphone refresh. There was so much potential but LG lacked the follow through to realize what was there. Now, how does this all relate to the wing? Well, it's pretty much the whole story of the wing. Most reviewers genuinely had positive things to say about it, but mostly in the context of it being a good attempt for a first generation device, which LG should definitely continue to improve upon. And it's honestly not hard to see why. The phone itself is larger and heftier than just about any other mainstream phone you can think of from the past few years. It makes my Fold 4 look small and feel light by comparison, which is always kind of surprising to be honest. However, that heft includes two nice looking OLED displays and a pop-up front facing camera which allows the upper display to only have the slightest of bezels. There's even a digitizer in the upper display for stylus support and a micro SD card slot for expanded storage. It all screams premium to the highest tier. Except for the fact that performance is undermined a bit by the Snapdragon 765G powering everything. The mid-range chipset was already a year old when the phone came out and it feels even older now, in some areas at least. There are a ton of these trade-offs while considering the LG Wing as a primary device, and they, along with the relatively expensive price tag compared to more performant phones at launch, likely contributed to it not selling all that well. Now, I'm not saying the Wing killed LG's smartphone business, but from what I've seen and experienced, it didn't quite incentivize them to keep the lights on. Honestly though, those were considerations of folks back in 2020. Here, in the future, I bought my wing for about $275, complete in box, sealed, late last year. At that price point, any negatives could only ruin the device if it were completely unusable. Which, spoilers, it isn't. Mine even received an update to Android 12 a while ago with the latest security update being just a few weeks old. You could totally rock this as a cheap primary device these days without too much worry. So the real question is really, how does it hold up several years later? As with the other dual screen phones we've covered so far on this channel, the answer is a bit complicated. Through general usage, I really don't feel that the phone is that slow. Loading and browsing web pages, opening apps, navigating menus, it all feels fairly fluid, with nothing that would suggest that this is a lower spec device, beyond the fact that my eyes have started to acclimate to higher refresh rate smartphone screens, making the 60Hz panel here 
look a bit blurrier. But yeah, in the months I've been using the phone on and off, it's been a great example of the fact that even older mid-range processors are probably enough for most people's use cases these days. If you just wanted a basic smartphone for everyday tasks, even overlooking the second screen, this is actually a pretty solid choice with no real dips in performance that I've noticed. It also has an all day battery life and good looking display, despite it being about two and a half years old at this point. If you ever get one of these, just remember to also get a case. Usually, I'm someone who doesn't like the feel of cases for long, but it's just about mandatory for the wing. The mirror finish of the glass on the back gets nasty with fingerprints quickly after cleaning and is so slick that the phones slid off tables more than once. A case also just makes everything feel a bit more comfortable to use and hold, especially given how large the wing is. Even now, the sheer size of the phone is a bit much, to be honest, even for my larger hands. But I don't entirely hate it, given my overall preference for larger displays. It just takes a bit of getting used to, and realization that this is a two-handed device that feels more than a bit awkward to balance in one hand. Fortunately, while balancing with both screens open still benefits from two hands, the second screen can be revealed easily with just a swipe of my thumb. To accommodate two displays, the entire body of the phone is separated into an upper and lower half, where the upper half swivels upward using a really neat looking hinge. Although I've had a few cases of the phone sliding partially open in my pocket, it generally takes a reasonable intentional amount of force to swivel up the upper screen. And LG nailed the feel of that swivel. To me, it's about the level of satisfaction I'd get from flicking open a flip phone, while feeling much more natural to do while using the phone like a normal device. If I get a message, need to respond to a comment, or want to search for something, it's almost second nature to swivel up the upper screen and immediately start using the squarish lower screen as a mini keyboard. The solid feel of the flat screen combined with the convenience of a dedicated space for the keyboard makes typing on this phone feel extra comfortable to me. Having it paired with that larger horizontal upper display feels like I have more room to just do what I need to do while using apps that manage to rotate correctly. And if the rotation doesn't happen to work well, closing the phone doesn't cause apps to stutter or break in my experience. It's all just extremely fluid. Similarly, it's really easy to just flip the phone upside down to use the upper display as a giant keyboard or rotate the whole phone 90 degrees and use the lower display as a mini second phone running an entirely separate app. That's super handy if I want to do typical smartphone things in typical smartphone orientations while still having something else running on the side like YouTube, Spotify, or some random web page I want to reference. That separation works pretty well most of the time due to it not relying on apps to be specifically optimized to work on the device. Some apps do only work on the upper screen though, but most apps can be whitelisted to work on the lower screen and tend to scale pretty well. Still, it's also a bit disappointing in how little the screens actually interact in practice. Unlike other dual screen concepts, the displays aren't actually connected. Well, how do I explain this? It's like, sure, a button press on the lower screen's menu can send an app to the upper screen or call it back, but it's less streamlined than the Axon M's permanent menu option or the Surface Duo's drag and drop approach. Having this kind of interaction limited to a single toggle reduces the overall flexibility and speed of using both displays at once. There's also no way to extend or span most apps. Both displays are pretty much independent of each other and only interact through a few limited system commands, unless developers specifically code otherwise. These commands are a keyboard, a trackpad, a game optimization menu, and a few general system settings. What's available does work really well. The keyboard's comfy, the trackpad's surprisingly useful for lazy browsing, and I'll never say no to more easily accessible settings options. 
the app-specific optimizations that do exist also feel quite nice. YouTube loads playback controls on the lower screen. The camera app also has this really cool gimbal control on the lower screen that's fun to use. And the built-in image editing tools offload controls to the lower screen to give a fuller view of the image on the upper display. But I can't help but want some way to properly span an app. Even if it looks janky most of the time, there are bound to be a few times where the experimentation pays off and gives way to a killer use case that can define the phone. After all, I've seen that plenty of times on the Axon M and Surface Duo line. And that segues into one of my disappointments regarding emulation. If you've been staring at the wing, thinking, wow, this would be really cool to use for DS emulation, I'm gonna have to disappoint you. This is honestly the first dual screen phone in my collection that I couldn't recommend for DS emulation because Drastic doesn't span across screens. That essentially means you'll be limited to stretching gameplay over the upper display, like a regular single screen slab phone. The best I could say about it is that DS emulation works well. And being one of the few smartphones with Wacom stylus support, it can play stylus heavy games decently well as well. But you might as well just buy a cheaper Note 10 Plus at that point. As far as dual screen gaming goes in general, it's basically limited to using a controller app like Softwing to apply touch controls on the lower screen as touch inputs on the upper screen. As far as touch controls are concerned, it's a bit finicky, but works well after a bit of setup. However, just in general, it's not all that impactful. The large upper display does have plenty of room for touch controls since it lends most games to having larger black bars on either side. As such, I've honestly had a better time just using the lower display to either show an additional app while playing a game or to play smaller games while watching YouTube videos. Good touch controls are especially crucial with this phone since the size limits controller options. Something like a Razer Kishi won't fit the thicker body and a GameSir X2 can't stretch far enough to hold the device. Meanwhile, the lower screen's width is too small for those clip-on controllers to grip without some sort of custom adapter. I've honestly had the best luck with an old-fashioned controller clip, but it's more than a little top-heavy for sure and blocks the lower screen from swiveling out. So, from a gaming perspective, there's no real benefit to the dual-screen form factor of this device unless you really need a chat, video, or game walkthrough open while playing a game with touch controls. Luckily, the overall gaming performance isn't too shabby, as long as you acknowledge that the Snapdragon 765G isn't the most powerful chip out there. Graphically intense Android games like Genshin Impact run smoothly, as long as you're fine dropping down to the low preset. Plus, it even scales correctly to the full width of the display, which is really nice. Less intense games, like Mario Kart Tour, obviously run quite well, but might introduce some black bars around the gameplay since they weren't built for such a large screen. Similarly, game streaming apps work as good as always, but Game Pass games have quite large black bars surrounding them since the service doesn't target widescreen aspect ratios. GeForce Now, on the other hand, is perfect for this device. Any games with widescreen support can be set to fill the entire screen. It's quite nice when paired with a controller and might actually be a killer feature for anyone who frequently uses the service. On the emulation side of things, I was pleasantly surprised by how well everything ran at lower resolutions. Ratchet & Clank runs smoothly via Aether SX2 with only the occasional dip to performance. Both Sonic Colors and Super Smash Bros. Brawl ran perfectly fine via Dolphin, albeit with a few more stutters in Smash Bros. overall, even at 1x native. Mario Kart Double Dash also ran perfectly fine via Dolphin, even at 2x native, with only the occasional hitch. Heck, even PS Vita emulation runs okay via Vita 3K. Street Fighter X Tekken is more than playable at 1x native, with just a few glitches during cutscenes. It's all very promising, especially for a lower-end device. 
The only time games start to stutter or run slow is when I start to crank up the resolution. That's to be expected, honestly, given that this is a lower powered chipset, but it does mean gameplay will look a bit blurry running at 1x native on such a large display. The only true downsides here tend to be, again, lower resolutions are a requirement at GameCube and above, and there are large black bars in any emulator you'd want to play due to the screen's size. Though all that extra space might work for anyone wanting to play with touch controls or for DS games with screens side by side. It's not all that appealing with a controller connected though, even if the OLED display makes the black bars a lot less noticeable. Compromise is the common theme of the wing. It's a really cool design and I love using it, but at every turn, it feels like there's another asterisk around using the device as significantly more than just a regular slab phone. Having two screens is great, but they don't interact all that well and can't be used for the types of interactions found in other dual screen phones. The phone's upper display looks great, has an impressive size, and works well toward enhancing the feel of certain games. But it's also very big and blocks the usage of some accessories while leading to large black bars and being difficult to use with one hand just in general. Heck, even the back of the phone looks really nice, but it's so slippery and fingerprint prone that I need to cover it up with a case. There's so much potential in this phone and form factor, and it's easy to imagine where LG could have gone next if they'd stuck around for a sequel. But they didn't. So we're left with something that's a little awkward and feels a bit unfinished. I can't hate the phone though. Honestly, even given all the downsides I've highlighted, this is still one of the coolest phones in my collection. I enjoy using it and constantly want to dig in to find even cooler ways to make use of its unique shape. Even considering its currently low price point, I wouldn't call it the best at anything, really, but I think it's just about the perfect device for anyone who wants something different than a typical smartphone. Better yet, it's great if they want a dual screen device without giving up the feel of a more typical smartphone. However, for anyone looking for a full dual screen experience, I'm afraid this isn't quite it. Those are my thoughts though. I'd love to know yours. Is there anything else about the wing that really sparks your interest? Or are you someone who picked up the wing a while back and has experiences you'd like to share? Let me know down in the comments. As always, also be sure to give this video a like if you found it interesting or informative, then get subscribed so you don't miss out on other smartphones with nifty designs in the future. I definitely have more than a few older phones sitting in my collection ready to be shared, but feel free to let me know if there are any personal favorites you might recommend I take a look at in the future. That's going to be all for this video though. Until next time, catch you later.